All right, let's do it. Let's go ahead, Jim. Okay, uh, intros. Um, my name is Jim Pick. I work at Protocol Labs. I'm working currently on the infrastructure testing team um, and also do PeerPad and PeerBase. And that's what I do. And how, um, how offline y are those projects currently? Not super offline. I tested PeerBase and it actually does work offline, which is sort of neat. Um, but like the, it, it, it coordinates to other nodes in a web browser using a uh, WebSocket server. So if you're offline, you can't talk to that. So that you need to figure out some way of actually talking peer to peer, but yeah. Gotcha. Okay, cool. We're doing a quick round of intros for those who just showed up, just sort of who you are and why you're interested in this crossover between D-Web and Offline First. Uh, Justin, you want to go next? Yeah. So I'm really interested in Offline First and D-Web because I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. I think that it better reflects kind of the way that we interact as human beings with our devices. So I think it'll be really cool when I can be like, hey, I've got this thing on my phone. Let's, let's do it together. And then I can just give you the data from my phone and we can start interacting using this app. Um, so Offline First plus D-Web is, is awesome. So that's me. I uh, created the gathering. As far as offlineiness goes, it's kind of the same constraint as Jim. It works offline, but since it uses WebSockets because it's in the browser, it's pretty much still centralized. And so you need something to connect to to get the browsers to talk. That's me. And I'll piggyback off that. Uh, I'm Victor Rordbet. I'm an independent developer. I work with uh, Justin on The Gathering. Lidl. Hello. Uh, so I'm working on IPFS in web browsers, more or less, and uh, related to local offline is my, my current work on um, running embedded JS IPFS inside of Brave browser. Um, and uh, what I want to happen is for people in like conferences or like remote places, uh, as long as they have uh, like a shared Wi-Fi or something similar uh, for those two web browsers. Uh, like people should be basically able to uh, open web UI or add stuff to IPFS uh, and those two web browsers should be able to exchange data with each other somehow. So that's like local discovery uh, in web browser is a big question mark right now. And I'd like to uh, get some ideas around that. Awesome, Dominic. Yeah, hey. Um, so I've mentioned this a couple of times, but like I, as a, as like a user and growing up in the place that I did, I kind of got really frustrated at a lot of things that we depended on not working or like really appreciated the value of having this vast searchable network to learn from. So I find that really important and I get a little frustrated at how fragile and like hard to work with some of that stuff is. So I work on Go IPFS and try to make it matter less if, uh, if your thing is online or offline, if you're connected or not, and just try to keep the data accessible to people. So that's it from me. Cool, Yanis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hello, uh, I'm Yanis. Um, I'm a researcher at uh, Protocol Labs working on primarily on content routing and DHT issues. Um, I'm also, uh, uh, or at least I'm coming from an academic background. I'm a lecturer at University College London. Um, and I have a very long-standing interest in um, offline communications or what has been traditionally called in the past, at least in academic circles, delayed tolerant networking. Um, I think, yeah, we've written our first papers about I don't know, 13 years ago or something. Um, uh, so, and since then we've been developing uh, protocols and mechanisms to uh, connect devices offline, propagate content from uh, A to B, 
uh, possibly using some relays and things like that. Um, yeah, so back then, you know, uh, mobile phones were not even a thing, but um, nowadays things are made easier with all the connectivity opportunities we have. Um, yeah, and we're, we're actually, some for some of them, we've got some demos and uh, libraries or applications that do what Justin uh, described before, kind of distributed data synchronization between uh, mobile devices to, I don't know, build local social networks or do whatever other thing. Um, I can talk more in detail about that in, uh, um, in some next call, next month or whatever. Yeah, that would be great. We'd love to have you do a demo on one of the one of our upcoming calls. Absolutely. Uh, I assume we don't have anyone else lurking here who I've missed. So I have kind of two two main things on the agenda for today. One is we want to give um, Justin and Victor a chance to show us the gathering, which is working its way towards fully offline, but is definitely in this concept of this like local collaboration idea and on its way there technically. Um, and the other is just an opportunity for anyone who's on this call who was at either a PFS camp or DWeb camp to share anything they found out about there, any of these conversations that are in this offline DWeb space that seemed interesting. Um, so let's kick it off with Justin and Victor, and then we can circle back with the time we have left. Um, so if either of you can go ahead and share your screen, I assume you have those powers. Yeah, I think Justin's going to be sharing the screen. Okay. Awesome. Um, so this is Victor. Um, I think I was going to just give a very brief overview of sort of what um, our intentions were with this and sort of how we ideated and got to where we were with uh, the gathering at IPFS camp and uh, what we sort of ideally want to see with the hope that uh, some of the folks on this call are some of the uh, the right people to kind of you know, point us in the right direction as far as what sorts of technologies might be able to get us from where we are now to the uh, the more promised land of uh, of offline uh, off, offline capabilities. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, the gathering is this idea that kind of came out of uh, ETH Denver, where where Justin and I met in February this year, and we were interested in this idea of trying to build something very small in the sense of um, having a very limited temporal and location-based uh, setting that was kind of a fun thing for the meet space where people are actually getting together and that used all kinds of uh, you know sort of distributed technologies and decentralized um, ideas to actually improve and enhance a you know very centralized specific meet space event um, and this is kind of coming from the sort of uh, background that I didn't come to um, IPFS or even uh, Denver with a with a full technical background. I was a lawyer for a long time and I've sort of come into this space via blockchain. And so um, the first things that appeal to me are the things that are more kind of consumer friendly. And so, you know, one of the things that's that's very clear in the space is that there aren't a ton of things that are, you know, ready for any kind of, um, you know, mass use or even just individual use that, that normal people can understand. And so, you know, that was one of the ideas here is can we use the existing decentralized technologies to just make something small and fun? Um, and so, what we kind of came up with is this idea that there's, there's a real problem with actually um, exchanging contact information when you meet people at a particular uh, event that has its own context, because typically the things that are out there are profiles that people have, let's say on Twitter or on LinkedIn or on other particular platforms or, or Telegram, where it's all very focused on that particular platform's utilization. And so we were thinking it'd be neat to have this idea of customizing existing sort of profile information that you have and sort of sharing different slices of yourself um, that were very customized to the types of people that you were meeting and the thing that kind of brought you together. And so we were always thinking about a couple of use cases for this that are beyond, you know, specific tech conferences and IPFS um, meetups and this kind of thing. Um, we think about things like college orientations where kids are first meeting each other um, and are trying to find their, their sort of um, peer group. We think about um, moments like, uh, you know, obviously like like professional gatherings and this kind of thing. Um, and we were just trying to think of something that would enhance those experiences um, without without sort of overriding them. And so we came up with this idea of a of an incentivized contact swapping protocol. So you insert the information that you want to um, share with people that you meet at a particular gathering. Whoever launches the gathering sets a sort of time 
deadline for when it's going to end. And this could, could be the organizer of a gathering. It could be anybody that just is attending one of these things. And then it creates this sort of um, this P2P network that uh, will essentially terminate at the end. And it doesn't totally terminate. The network doesn't go away, but the incentivization mechanisms go away at the end of the expiration of the time period. And so the incentivization is you can meet each other and what you could exchange contact information with the folks that you meet um, at the gathering. And then once you've collected a number of different contacts, you have the ability within the app and it's sort of encouraged through the incentivization structure to recommend that people meet each other. And so the idea being that we're trying to raise the likelihood that people find and make deep and meaningful connections with each other at these types of events, because it's definitely our sense that as great as events like IPFS camp are, um, which was one of the best types of events of those, those types that I've ever been to, um, you always had this idea that, you know, there was one person that you didn't talk to that maybe would have been a transformative relationship that could have come from that, where it would have given you a new solution to a problem you're having, where it could have been, you know, the sort of formulation of a new type of project that changed your career. Um, and so this idea that there are, are always this, like, this lost potential whenever people that have the same sort of affinities get together. And so what we're trying to do is incentivize people to help you know, shrink that gap of lost potential, not get rid of it, but really just reduce it and, and encourage people to make uh, more and, and deeper connections with the people that they're you know, most aligned with. And so the way that this happens in the app is you essentially have blockchain-based trophies that are incentivizing matchmaking behavior where you're allowed to make recommendations um, that so-and-so meet so-and-so. And if those two people do meet, the matchmaker is rewarded in the system and um, trophies are minted on a blockchain to um, show off as badges of um, community good behavior. Um, and one of the neat things about this is that you can start to calculate average degrees of separation um, of all the other members within a particular gathering. Uh, we're calling that the Kevin Bacon score. Um, and each person has a Kevin Bacon score and then the whole gathering has a Kevin Bacon score. And so you can kind of look at, look at sort of how tightly knit a community is uh, based on the number of people that are in there and how many connections they're making and recommendations, et cetera. So with that kind of am ambition, we wanted to build something using IPFS, a little bit of blockchain, and then right now, and Justin will talk a bit more about where we are technically, um, we're using WebSockets and we're using a signaling server um, and we have had to rely on you know, a, a persistent online uh, connection at IPFS camp. Um, however, the goal is to get uh, to using technologies that allow folks to do this. I think one of our aims here is to have the gathering work in a cave as long as people have devices. So um, with that kind of basic introduction, I will turn it over to Justin to kind of walk through where we're at. Cool. Thanks for that intro. I think that covers it. Um, yeah, Victor and I met back at, at East Denver and it was at a team building thing. People were basically saying the things that they were interested in so they could find other people to work with at the hackathon. And it, it was like, well, of course this thing needs to exist. We're all here. There's like 200 people here trying to do this exact thing. Obviously, we need a tool that can help us do this because otherwise, how are we going to get organized and find each other? So when I heard him talk about making games for the meat space, like like the gathering, I was like, oh, well, this is a, this is a given. This needs to exist. And so it's been a work of love. And uh, we were asked to present a lightning talk on it for uh, IPFS camp. And so we had to hurry and get it ready, get it into a state where it could semi work. And it was a whole learning process as well, which I'll have to talk about at the end of this. So um, like you talked about, there's a bunch of different slices that we have of ourselves, the so things that we care about, that we go to conferences and, and there's people around us that care about those things as well, but it's hard to even know that they're interested in those things. Like, you might be having a conversation about, you know, the web and not know that they're also interested in decentralized IP or decentralized finance or something like that, or, or even something way distant from decentralization. So to be able to start to expose things that you care about, that you, you want to talk to other people about is, is a really interesting opportunity. Um, so I put together a little demo for this call. If you have a phone, you can scan this QR code or you can just go to this URL right here on your computer. Um, and what, what's inside of that code and inside of this little shortcut link is an OrbitDB address, um, which is what you'll use to basically get the data for the database that we're all sharing as part of the gathering. Um, 
and then a member ID, which is what you're going to use to connect with me. So I've already joined the gathering and you're going to send a connect request to me and then a peer ID. So it's going to be the ID of a device that you'll then connect to, to basically download the data that you need and help bootstrap the connections to the other peers within the gathering. So, um, you guys all have a chance to get that. I am going to switch to a screen so we can do a little live demo here about how this thing works. Uh, all right. So if you need to get in, yeah, gather.io, gthr.io slash demo. And then inside of here, hey, look at that. There's all you guys. <laughs> so uh, awesome, and it's live updating. So you guys are in there already. Some of you probably already experienced this at IPFS camp. So I'm going to go ahead and confirm these. And you guys will be getting connect requests up in your little plus thing there. They should be from tactic indebted until I change my name here. Um, so let me change this and you guys can, and then I'll walk you through how this is all working. Uh, there, put a picture in there and let's put my email and okay, cool. And then I'll add some affinities. So affinities are kind of like those slices that I was talking about. So you might say some things that you care about. So, you know, we're, we're all here because of uh, IPFS or offline. And you can select different colors here as well. And the reason for the colors was eventually we'd like to be able to, you know, expose those colors more easily on this list here. So you can easily see the interest that people have rather than having to click in there and see. So um, as you can see, you can have some, some scoring elements here that Victor was talking about. So this is like a scoreboard up here and it shows you um, your position and the person in first place. So right now I'm in first for MVP. MVP is just the total number of points. You get a um, certain amount of points for connecting with somebody. You get a certain amount of points for recommending somebody. You get more points when somebody accepts a recommendation, so on and so forth. So what I can do here, for example, is I can go into uh, Jim's profile here and click send recommendation. And I can say, hey, Jim, you know, you should talk with Victor. And what that's going to do is it's going to send Jim, he'll, he'll see a little thing up here that says, oh, you got a re recommendation to meet Victor. So now the hope is that Jim will go and talk to a Victor. And then Victor will be like, hey, my, my code name is such and such. He'll type in Victor's code name there and hit connect, and then they'll be connected. So the cool thing about this is because it's... Jim, by the way, did you get that? I can give you my code name. This is Victor. Yeah, yeah I, I guess got, I got it. I just talking. need a code name to accept it, I guess. So. All right, yeah, so here's, here's a code name for you. Tasting, T-A-S-T-I-N-G, space, imprecise, I-M-P-R-E-C-I-S-E. And now anybody else that just heard that can also okay. enter that and kind of force a connection between the two of us. Your request to connect has been sent. Okay, there it so, is. So, Justin, you're recommending that they go find that person in person. You're not doing anything that shares the contact yeah, info in the app? Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. So it's not sharing the contact info. It's supposed to basically say, hey, you should go talk to this person in, in real life, right? And so they, they'll need to go and figure out how to meet up with that person. It, it, it will include their public info, so it'll have Jim's picture and his name. And if he had put in an organization, it would have that as well. Um, and, and that would help, hopefully help uh, Jim or Victor find each other. Um, so the, that's yeah, kinda, just one quick thing, Justin, to add here is that code names are generated uh, randomly for each gathering. And they're important that they be kept secret and that they're unique, unique. So you don't want to use like a Twitter handle or a name that you commonly go by as your code name, because presumably then anybody who knew that about you could just kind of connect with you at any gathering. So the idea is that you want to make up something either unique to that particular gathering, some sort of funny code name that you like, or you can use the, the randomly generated uh, code name that the, that the system spins up for you. That's right. So if we look in here, I can show you a little bit about how this is working. So you can see all of our connected devices here. So we're all connected to each other, um, sharing this. It, it, it uses OrbitDB, which basically uses PubSub to sync up information about the current head of an append-only log. So anytime anybody takes any action, it's adding an item to that log 
which then um, gets converted into a data structure. So let me show you what that data structure looks like, and then I'll show you what that log looks like as well. It looks like this might not be the latest version of this page. There we go. Um, so there's this append only log. So you can see uh, anytime somebody takes action, it's, it's writing an entry here. And so for example, oh, looks like Dominic just wrote another something to the log. He updated his member profile here. So there's his name, the CID for his avatar, and then his peer ID, and then you've got the public info, which is you know his code name and his public key, and then you have the private info, which is encrypted, which I'll ex explain how that gets decrypted so that I can then view his information. So now if I looked inside of here, I would see you know Dominic's private stuff. Um, all right, so let me jump back here to the little presentation here, and I can show you how that's working. So you have that append-only log that we looked at, and inside of that append-only log, it gets it gets used to reduce that log back to a data structure that then um, gets used within the app. So um, for example, and this is simplified, there's some other data structures in there. There's, uh, there's the members, and inside of the members, there are me and Victor, and we're ordered by our member ID, and we have our public info and our private info, like you saw there with Dominic. And then inside of a connection, um, people can add themselves to your connection. So if Victor wanted to connect with me, if he sent me a connect request, he'd be adding his member ID to my connections list. And inside of there, there's a little status thing, so I can reject or I can accept Victor's connect request. And then when he sends me that connect request, he's also sending me the key to unlock his private info encrypted with my public key which only I can decrypt because I've got my private key here on my device. So that's how the gathering DB basically works um, offline. So what that means is that I could connect with Terry, even if my device isn't connected to the internet, and it's going to append to that log, and she could do the same, connect with me, and then it'll append to the log. And then when we come back online, I'll get this request added to my connections, and then I'll be able to use that to unlock her info. So that way we can still connect with each other even when we're disconnected for one reason or another, or if the Wi-Fi is spotty and slow, it'll still work as fast as our device want it to work and then sync up later. Um, any questions there before I keep moving? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so in case of, in case there is no connectivity, how do devices connect to synchronize? Do you use, I mean, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi Direct or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get to that. That's, okay. a, that's a great question. And, and yeah, we'll get there. Um, let's see. I'll talk about this gathering snapshot thing later. That was one of the things we learned at IPFS Camp. So I'm going to keep moving here. Um, so here's how it works right now. Uh, like Jim talked about in his intro, um, they're decentralized, sort of. Um, browsers have to use WebSockets right now to, to communicate with the, the IPFS network. There's not a way for them to directly connect with each other uh, unless they manually swap signaling info for WebRTC connections, which is kind of unfeasible. Um, it's a little bit more feasible when you start to do it in person, but it's a, such a large amount of data, it's still kind of a pain. There's been experiments about doing it with you know, scanning QR codes at the same time to swap the info, but nothing's great yet. Um, so this is kind of how things are working right now. What that means is that if there was a disconnect and they couldn't connect to this WebSocket relay and the thing that's acting like a P2P relay, they wouldn't be able to share data with each other. So kind of decentralized, more like it's not. Um, what we thought we could do is you could theoretically create like an app that goes on somebody's phone and they could be the the gathering organizer. And what that could do is they could then, you know, uh, do the, uh, they, they could allow devices to tether to their phone or to their computer or whatever. And then they could run the app on their phone to basically host a, uh, a WebSocket server that then the devices could connect to and then use that, that relay, basically send all the data through that device as well. So that way they could still be within their own little network operating inside of a cave, 
whatever um, without having to be connected to the wider internet and it should technically work. Um, as far as seeing this something that works like that, I haven't seen anything that quite works like that, but I think that it could work. So maybe we'll work on something like that eventually. Um, ideally how it would work is something like this, where all the devices can just communicate with each other through WebRTC and signaling magic, which doesn't quite exist yet, or with Bluetooth. Um, unfortunately, as far as I know, you can't access Bluetooth through the browser um, yet, but probably given time, that might happen. And, and maybe there will even be wrappers for, uh, oh, looks like I got a little chat here, wrappers for, um, oh, it can work. Okay, yeah, you should tell me about that. Do you want to talk about that, Giannis? Right, so, so um, are you talking about uh, this or the, the previous slide? Right, uh, a bit for both, but maybe okay. maybe it's better for you to finish what you want to say to avoid the entire yeah. thing and then, okay. um, yeah. yeah. Let, let's come back to this then. All right, um, so some things that we'd like to see, I'm gonna come back to this too. I wanna talk about the lesson for IPFS camp first. So one of the things that we learned really early on is that the public IPFS relays and uh, swarms available for WebSockets and, and WebRTC are, are really slow. Um, they're full of a lot of dead nodes and it makes it really hard for peers to find each other. Um, so when we went to camp, we tried to onboard the first few people and they couldn't find the database and they couldn't find the other peers because there was just too many dead nodes out there that they couldn't, it would essentially time out before they could make the connection. Um, so we switched to a private signaling server and it was way faster. Uh, the next thing is bad Wi-Fi ruins parties. So um, at IPFS camp, the Wi-Fi was getting hammered because there was so many people using it, doing a ton of different things. And so it was just really slow. So even though it could work offline, onboarding people was really slow because they'd be downloading a ton of different DAG entries for this op log that was eventually a thousand records long, which kind of leads to this next thing is CRDT op logs are, have a ton of overhead. Um, if you're doing small operations, it's almost like a, a 10X or a 100X overhead, just because of the extra information that needs to be included to basically verify who did it and at what time they made that operation. So for example, at the end of IPFS camp, the, the op log was 30 megabytes for a almost 200 kilobyte data set, which is pretty crazy. There's probably much better ways to do that. I think deltas have, have looked interesting, but it's more to look into there. Um, another thing we learned is to always use a buddy. And what I mean by that is, is when you're onboarding somebody, they're gonna be scanning the QR code on your phone and your, your phone is on. So they should be able to connect directly to your phone and get that data from you. And so back when I talked about the snapshots, one thing that we learned is that you don't have to wait for the whole op log to download. Instead, what you can do is um, you can give that, that person that's onboarding a snapshot of the current state that you have and send that to them and then, and then let them slowly download the op log from the rest of the network, including you, to then basically have all that they need to um, continue to operate and verify the state that you gave them. But this allows them to basically onboard immediately and then start having fun inside of the gathering without having to wait five minutes for the, the, the list of everything that everybody's done to download. Um, last thing was, if you don't have debug info inside of the thing or some way to get to debug information, it's gonna be really hard to figure out what's going on. Since there's not, to, with centralized systems, it's, it's easier to kind of um, debug what's happening because you can track everything, you can see all the requests coming in, but with decentralized systems, there is no backend, it's all within that front end app. And so it's really helpful to have some loading info and some debug info in there that can help you kind of see how things are working. So that was it for IPFS camp lessons. Um, last thing I'd like to talk about before we go into questions and, and potential solutions is things that we'd like to see. Um, one of the things that we're really interested in is the idea of a baked in IPFS node into like a browser or into a, a browser page, kind of like a Lunet. I don't know if you guys have heard about that. Essentially what they're doing there is they're making it so that 
um, you can browse IPFS content inside of essentially a browser that has IPFS embedded. It's kind of crazy. Um, so that would be really cool because if you did that, then you could make it so that people could um, pull that content from your device without having gone to that web page before. So it starts to get into that solution that I thought would be awesome, which is, you know, I, I come to this event, they're offline, but this person has the gathering on their phone. I can then get the gathering from their phone and use it on my phone. So that starts to help with that. Um, the next thing is built-in peer discovery on mobile devices and web browsers. Right now, as far as I know, the best way to do that is through signaling and relays. It'd be really cool if we had the ability to use like MDNS within local networks to be able to have devices find each other. That'd be cool. Um, and then detaching users from devices. What I mean by that is, is sure, you know, if I have my phone here, you can say this is me, but I also have a computer that I use and it'd be great to more easier for me to be able to use both without having to worry about trying to swap keys between them instead of having something that that is me that persists between every device that I use um, and, and then maybe being able to have my my user information my data stored somewhere else of my choosing so that's going to be helpful to see that um, and then uh, composable components and functions within IPFS what I mean by that is is uh, we build a lot of front-end frameworks. We build a lot of tools with front-end frameworks like React, and they base things on components. And it would be really cool if we could start to make reusable components that you could then use to basically compose applications um, out of those components. And what I mean by that is, is if we could make it so, for example, in the gathering, I could expose you know, this little component here that is me and make it so that that's usable in other apps. That, that would be cool because then we could allow people to start to put together their own apps essentially or reuse data sets and components from other apps. So I could take this and put it inside of a, a decentralized Twitter or I could take uh, my Instagram feed and put it inside of, a, inside of the gathering or something like that. Um, so definitely interested in seeing something like that. Um, any questions? That was, that was it for my presentation here. All right. Um, yeah, so Giannis, I'd like to hear what you were going to say about uh, how this could work. Um, right, so I might be off topic, but um, I've got a few uh, things that we've I've, I've seen around before. So you said that the problem is that you can, the browser cannot see the Bluetooth connection, and that's why you cannot connect two devices between them. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. As far as I know, there's not APIs for the browser to be able to talk via Bluetooth. Mm. Okay, I, I can have a look at that because we've been doing something quite similar. But in case, in any case, if if you use, have you used Wi-Fi Direct? Because that's that's completely that's you know the the device that you have at the top there, who is uh -huh. the, um, the gathering owner or group owner, whatever, can be the Wi-Fi group owner. So, and then all other connection, all other devices, what they see is effectively that they're connected to a Wi-Fi access point. So the yeah. browser doesn't need to know if it's connected to another device or, um, or uh, to, you know, to a Wi-Fi access point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what I was thinking here is, for example, I know that you have the ability to tether devices to your phone. So if I turn on my, my personal hotspot here, I don't know if you guys can see that, then what it does is it essentially connects this up, creates a Wi-Fi network that devices can connect to. So the thought is, is doing that, even if my phone's not connected to the internet, it's creating a network that the other devices can connect to. So essentially doing what you were saying, Giannis, creating a, a, an ability for other devices to connect directly to the device that would then be kind of like the facilitator for the gathering. Right. So yeah. It seems like a pretty good stopgap for the limitations that we have currently. Um, mm, mm, okay, yeah. So, so Bluetooth is, is kind of restricted in some of these cases, but what we've, we're doing is that we're, um, we're using um, the combination of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi direct so that one of them does the service discovery and the other one is actually connecting and 
um, uh, transferring data. Uh -huh. So, I mean, um, I, I can dig through the more technical details and I can let you know. Um, but the other thing is that I've seen recently um, so from some colleagues that what they did is actually they didn't do this on the mobile phone, but what they did is they assume you have some Raspberry Pi or something which is in the same area and this is effectively doing the web server and you run what you want to run as an instant web app or progressive web app or whatever it's called. So, so effectively the server is at the Raspberry Pi and all other devices they can connect to that and you don't need to have connectivity to the rest of the world because you're doing everything locally. Mm -hmm. So does they basically cre create a network from the Raspberry Pi and then right. the other devices connect to that? Yeah. Okay. Or, or at cool. least, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, okay, this is not, um, how can I say, it's not super convenient because you have to have this other device and you have to have it plugged in. Mm -hmm. um, but they did that because, yeah, uh, for several reasons, just uh, as an extra um, thing when people don't want to download applications, for example. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's interesting, too, because... Uh, it's not unfeasible for somebody that's going to initiate the gathering to have some kind of app on their phone to start that. But what it allows is it makes it so that not everybody has to have the app. Instead, just one person has to have it and the rest can just use a browser, which right. is is fine because then they don't have to download an app, which is exactly. kind of what we're wanting to solve. We don't want to force people to download something just for a one-time use kind of thing. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think if if um, if you want, I can I can have a look at uh, uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi Direct and what's happening with the browsers themselves, and I can let you know. I can remember it's been some time that I looked into this. Cool. Yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate that. That'd be really helpful. Um, if you guys don't have any questions, I actually have some questions for you guys. Then um, something that I've been spending a lot of time looking into is more efficient ways to store the data that we use here. Um, like I talked about, there's quite a bit of overhead with the op log approach. Um, and, and it kind of forces it to not scale very well. We want to be able to support a gathering where there's a thousand people and they're making connections with, you know, 10, 15 other people at this, at the, the events. Um, and right now, it just really wouldn't work very well. Um, that would result in, you know, 60, 70, 80 megabytes of data, which I think technically you can't even do in index DB on mobile devices. I think they kind of limit you to like 50. So what that means is that it, it's kind of constrained to small gatherings now, which is not where we want to be. So, um, I know that Jim spent a lot of time working on, on peer base and, Delta CRDTs, what would you recommend as maybe a better way to keep peers in sync knowing that they're going to be on and off during the duration of this collaborative thing? Yeah, I, th I think there's a, there's a lot of sort of researchy sort of projects in the area and PeerBase is one of them. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure how much uh, memory it would take if you had like a thousand people with a you know a full profile stored in memory, um, it's it's going to store most of it in JavaScript, um, but then it'll in, in store like these encrypted blobs uh, in. But it does it does use a, a binary encoding, so it might actually be a little bit less space than OrbitDB. I have to compare. Um, okay. Also, also at um, IPFS camp, there is Viktor Grishchenko, and he's working on something called replicated object notation. And that's his thing, is like really compressing down the, the, the data that gets stored into as few bits as possible. And that's a really interesting project, but it's very much um, research stage. Uh, so. Cool. All right. Well, I'll have to look into that. Awesome. Well, thanks guys. Thanks for taking the time to do the little demo with me and for connecting with me on, on the gathering. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out if you guys have any questions and uh, thanks.
Thank you. Thanks for sharing. It's awesome. Any other questions before we move on to more kind of event recap stuff? All right. So let's start with IPFS camp. I think all of us were there, right? Is that where I met you, Yannis? Does it, did anybody come across, apart from the gathering, did anybody come across other interesting projects in this kind of crossover D-Web offline space that they want to share? Did you, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lidl. Uh, something that comes up uh, related to Bluetooth is uh, Bertie had a, Bluetooth, uh, they had a stand during science fair showing uh, Bluetooth transport, and they plan to open source it, I believe, at some point. So it's something to look at uh, or look for forward, because um, uh, that would uh, be a, a way of solving local discovery and also, uh, yeah, solving a lot of things. <laughs> so I'm really excited about that. Sorry, can I, can you repeat a little bit what, what that was? Sorry, I didn't. Uh, yeah, uh, Berti Technologies is a like, company, I believe, and they created Bluetooth Low Energy Transport for the P2P. Ah, okay. If you can share a pointer. Uh, I, I'll dig a link and paste it on the chat shortly. Did anyone else see cool stuff at camp? Yeah, did you guys have a chance to play the interspace tag, interplanetary tag that the textile guys had put together? So they were using a textile thread to essentially play tag. So what it would do is you'd, I, I did never get tagged. I participated, but I did never get tagged and I was never it. So I don't know exactly how it works, but basically the idea was that you would have people join this game of tag and then somebody would get tagged it and then they had to go and tag somebody else. And I guess it was something like scanning a QR code or something like that to essentially tag them. Yeah, if I remember cool. right, you were, you were obligated to scan if you got tagged. <laughs> that was super cool. I liked um, Jerome's project about basically when he goes to conferences and stuff like that, he wanted a way to play with his cat. So he came up with this way of like using lib peer to peer to control a laser and a camera at home. So while he's away, you know, he can connect and just peer to peer do that. And then he was talking about, well, since it's already peer to peer, why don't we just like aggregate these things so you could have the service where you could play with a random cat, like cat roulette. Um, and I thought that that was a fantastic little project. So I saw that. The gathering was also pretty cool. Anything else fun? Was anyone here at D Web Camp? I didn't make it. Nope. Okay, I think so. There are a couple of people who were there, including Molly, but who can't make the call today. So we may end up getting some feedback from them on a later call. Um, is there anything else that people would like to chat about today? We have another 14 minutes if there's more stuff people want to talk about. Yes, Lido. Uh I'm really bad at multitasking, but uh, I pasted a link to the tweet uh, with some details about the Bluetooth transport, in case you want to follow uh, that. Uh, going back to the problem of uh, local discovery in web browser, that's something very close uh, to my problem. That's like a my problem space. Uh, and uh, we had some improvements related to IPNS that sort of introduced um, a concept of um, 
something like IPFS beacon for local, local networks. So uh, things like gathering or peer pad, uh, when we, so we try to uh, make them work uh, in venues which had a very tricky situation of upstream internet connection, uh, what we usually do, we run like a local, like we run local signaling server basically. And the idea uh, is to make it less uh, explicit and make it uh, sort of like a, an ambient service. Uh, so right now you can run uh, things like NTP server, you, have, uh, you can have the DNS server on your local network, you can have uh, NAS storage, and those some of those things like NAS storage can announce itself on a local network using MDNS, and it effectively gets uh, something that local uh, host name. So uh, it's like a very rough idea, but uh, the th the idea was to sort of have a prepackaged uh, a ser service that could run that you could run in your local network or network of a conference or things like that that would uh, provide those uh, signaling services and maybe some pinning services and things like that uh, for uh, IPFS nodes and that would announce uh, itself on both MDNS for others to connect to it as well as get this uh, something that local host name that every node in a local network can access it through. And what get, when it gets interesting is when you get actual host name, uh, that host name can be like pre well known, predefined. So then web browser nodes can just check if there's anything there. And you get like this like, Rube Goldberg's uh, machine-like uh, scheme of uh, a local discovery. So the web browser node can just check if there's like a local beacon that it can uh, access. And if it's there, it, it would just expose like HTTP service, right? So the node in the web browser could just ask it for stuff, make API calls. Uh, and we have like concepts of uh, we are have a work in progress for things like delegated routing and things like that. So that could be like a short circuit, short circuit. Just oh, there's a beacon on my local network, so I prioritize this because I know it's here. Uh, um, so that's like more like uh, a problem space to think of than like actual thing. But I thought it's interesting to mention on this call. Yeah, there's there's another. Um aspect to this where I'm thinking of not exactly offline, but you have multiple users in one physical location and they want to rendezvous, but they're actually on different networks. Like they might be on their cell phones. So it's like, maybe they're all connected to the internet, but how do they find each other? Like if they all like rendezvous, they all talk to the same server and say maybe they use geofencing or something with GPS, then they can find each other. Um, Cause I don't know. So it's like, is it, is it, is it the same problem or is it a different problem? Uh, I think it's like a, a more generalized, if we think about more generalized problem of like local discovery, local discovery may, may mean local network, but also like ge ge geofencing. And I sort of uh, remembered another discussion I had with uh, some folks uh, during IPFS camp about like local discovery based on like the physical proximity, namely in the same room. So uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar, Google has this product called Chromecast. You plug this small pen drive like thingy to HDMI port to TV and it, you can just cast videos uh, to there. And it's actually interesting because uh, if you are on the same network, then it pops up on your Android phone. Oh, there's a screen you can cast your videos to. However, it also works when you are not on the same network. Um, and that's interesting, right? How it works. So I did some spelunking and turns out uh, they send uh, 
So there's like a splash screen for, for Chromecast. It's basically like a HDMI screen, so it provides audio and video. So there's like a code on the screen displayed in, you, in case you want to manually pair with the screen. But I did not enter any code and it's still shown on the list, right? So there must be something else. So the thing that's, the something else thing is audio. What is happening in, or at least it was in past, the Chromecast was playing very, I think it was like alt, very high or very low sounds that people were not able to register, but your phone was able to register. Uh, so that's like one way to do local discovery. <laughs> I think it's an interesting thing to think about. That's wild. Interesting. I wonder if you could do that with signaling data for WebRTC connections. Honestly, I've uh, digged a bit deeper on that like rabbit hole of companies just putting sounds and turns out when you got like assistants like uh, Alexa or like Google Home or th those things like that. And when you have like uh, commercials in the TV about those products, people there are speaking those keywords, but those keywords do not trigger your, right? So in the commercial itself, before the keyword is uh, said, they as well just put some sounds that people are not able to hear. <laughs> Basically, you tell the assistant to ignore this. Thank you. My back is because I've been oh, wow. It's like audible escape codes. Yeah, That's so it's crazy. Like, those things are rampant. It's like very popular thing to just emit sounds that people don't can hear, but your devices are aware of those sounds. So that is amazing. I worked yeah. on a project that did that for a little bit where they were transmitting sound, uh, data over sound. And this was a while ago, but I remember one of the problems with it was a lot of like, a lot of data in the, in the transfer. Like there was so much noise and like you needed so much parity and all this stuff to reconstruct the data. That was the primary concern. I don't know how things have evolved since then, but apparently it's good enough for Google. Do you know what like the throughput was for that kind of connection? I can't remember, but it was not good. Yeah, I'd imagine it's pretty low. <laughs> it's, it's low and you have to retransmit so much. Yeah, but if we are able to basically like signal that join this pops up room <laughs> and wait for instructions. <laughs> yeah. We cool. talked about also in this call previously a, a nasty hack of like, using almost similar to what you were saying Lytle where instead of an HTTP server you would basically set up like an SMB or like a CIFS share and do have all like the MDNS stuff around that where you can have host names or like domain names whatever you want to use um, and basically like hijacking that to, to put instead of naming the share you would basically name it your multi-adder or something like that and use something else to connect to it but then also use the share itself to like transfer IPFS over. If, I don't know how that would work in browsers, but like at the OS level, we were trying to think of like, how do we get IPFS on a, a machine that doesn't have IPFS already? And it was like, send it over SMB and then use the share name to bootstrap essentially. And it was, it was just a weird thing. It never went further than that. That's like actually like pretty clean way to, to put like, yeah. <laughs> but those sounds, man, those sounds. Whoa. Yeah. All right. So we have four minutes left. Um, Giannis, would you like to give us a sneak preview? Just say a couple words about the thing that you'll show us probably on our next call. Um, right, yes. Um, so it has to be very brief. I don't have uh, slides with me right now. Is um, So what we've done is that uh, we have built a library uh, which effectively and, and a very sample application on top of it where 
um, effectively devices connect uh, individually from one device to the other irrespective of the network and they share, they can share files between them so um, you can think of that as um, I mean uh, social network type of thing where there is um, there is a group that we can say okay we can call it group ABC and then whatever content we share in this group then you know other devices when they see something that uh, they don't have they're going to connect and synchronize themselves with um, the device that actually has the content um, so as I said before the way we do that is we use both Bluetooth flow energy mainly for service discovery but then the data is transferred over Wi-Fi direct because that's higher throughput connections um, and yeah, the, the current implementation is that, you know, effectively nodes advertise what they have through a blue, blue um, through a bloom filter that other devices see, and they compare to what they have, and that's how they um, realize whether they actually they're missing something that has been published elsewhere and they connect to get the new content. So devices do not connect randomly, they just connect only when they see that, you know, one of them has got something that others don't. Um, and that's how content can propagate actually through devices uh, when they're collocated. Um, and yeah, we've got a, a pretty stable uh, Android application for that uh, can be used for, I mean, we've stress tested that for large uh, files up to, I don't know, a few hundred megabytes, something like that. Um, uh, and it's quite stable across several versions of Android and Android devices. Um, yeah, and if you have, it's called data hop. So if, if you want to, uh, if you have two Android devices and want to play around with it, I mean, it's not super beautiful or anything, but um, yet, but um, um, yeah, it's something that uh, the team has developed and it's kind of usable and useful. What was the name of it? Data Hop? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. That sounds very cool. We will look forward to a, a demo yeah. on one of our upcoming calls. So just so everyone is aware, we did this call at the not our normal week of the month this month. The next one should be August 21st is the next time we'll see each other. So the third Wednesday in August, same time. Um, I'll start a new issue in the repo. So it's uh, IPFS slash local dash offline dash collab is the repo. So if you want to watch that repo to make sure that you see those notifications when they come up and I usually tag people who might want to attend and say a little something about what we'll be talking about and the agenda doc that we've been looking at together is always there for you to add agenda items to. And on that, on the note side of that, I would love it. Occasionally I will miss a few words or don't yeah. When the words that fly by me aren't ones I understand, I take worse notes. So yeah. if any of you have time to pop in there right now and fix up the notes I just took for this call, that would be awesome. Um, but it was great to see everyone. Thank you, Justin and Victor, for sharing the gathering with us. It was really cool to see kind of more under the hood than we had time to necessarily at IPFS camp. So very cool. And we hope to see everybody next month. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone.